Yo, what's up? Welcome back to another episode of the SWAS NFL Week 11 Sunday. Uh, gonna do it the same way I've been doing the last few weeks. Gonna get through as many games as I can in this video. Probably not gonna get through them all. Uh, but whatever I don't get to, we'll go through on the live show tomorrow, 11 a.m. Eastern time. We'll be live from 11 a.m. up to about 12.30. We'll go through every single game on the board. So if you're able to make it, we'd love to see you in the comments. NFL Sunday, week 11. Let's do it. Welcome to the Swiss. The Swiss. Swiss. Hey, get the Suez. First up, we got Green Bay on the road in Chicago. This line is now five and a half. It was at six and a half, but now I'm seeing nothing but five and a halves across the board. Total sitting at 40 and a half across the board as well. Uh, let's take a look at the pie charts. And according to the data, action's coming in pretty heavily on the Green Bay side. Over 75% of the tickets, over 85% of the money. As I always say, take this data with a grain of salt. So let's get into this matchup. We'll start with the Packers offense against the Bears defense. This should be a pretty good matchup here. Bears top 10, maybe even top five pass defense this year. Ninth in yards per pass attempt, fourth in success rate per drop back, first in EPA, sixth in overall DVOA against the pass, against the Green Bay passing attack. Six in yards per pass them 15th in success rate per drop back, eighth in EPA, six in DVOA. We have to keep in mind, though, when we're looking at the Packers' offensive numbers, specifically the passing numbers. Actually, the rushing numbers were affected as well. Uh, Malik Willis was playing quarterback for two and a half of those games. So a little tougher to get a read on the Packers' offensive numbers this year. But I want to talk about the Bears' pass defense, which seems to be just falling off a cliff here. In weeks one through five, this is looking like it might be the best pass defense in the entire NFL. They were allowing less than 195 passing yards per game. 6.4 yards per attempt, 40% success rate per drop back, an average opponent pass rating of 65.8. They were playing lights out against the pass for the first five games of the season. Look at the last four games. 226 passing yards allowed per game isn't bad, but 7.6 yards per attempt, 50% success rate per drop back, 88.2 average opponent passer rating. And what concerns me about this particular matchup not only have the Bears been struggling against the pass recently, but the strength of this Bears pass defense is the pass rush. They're sixth in pressure rate, 10th in pass rush grade, 11th in adjusted sack rate. That's what made the Bears pass defense so great. They're able to pressure the passer at a very high rate. The problem with that, Green Bay's been one of the best offensive lines in the NFL in terms of pass protection. 13th in pressure rate, first in pass blocking grade, first in adjusted sack rate. So if Green Bay's offensive line is able to neutralize the Bears pass rush, Bears defense could be in a situation here against Jordan Love. If we take a look at the passing numbers by depth, want to know where the weak spot is of this Bears defense? The deep ball. Want to know what Jordan Love throws a lot of? Deep passes. 17.1% of his pass attempts this year have been considered deep passes, and he's very efficient with them too. Jordan Love throws a great deep ball, and the Bears have struggled against deep passes. So you combine that with the fact that he may have time to throw in the pocket, Definitely don't like that. But what about the coverage matchup? The Bears run a lot of cover three, a lot of single high safety looks. Jordan Love against cover three, just 31st in completion percentage. So not very efficient, but fifth in yards per pass attempt. So that kind of fits right in. A lot of big plays. Not the most efficient thrower overall, but he does connect on those big plays against cover three. And against single high safety looks, it's kind of the same thing here. 35th in completion percentage, 29th in pass rating, but 10th in yards per pass attempt. So as far as the matchup goes between Jordan Love and the Bears pass defense, it's kind of tough to call because on paper, he shouldn't be able to consistently make throws and move the chains in this game, but the big plays may be there. He should connect on a couple deep plays, which makes it really unpredictable because big plays are very volatile. If the big plays are there, Packers could score 35 points. If he doesn't connect on those big plays, Packers could have a rough offensive game in this one. So it puts us in a really tough spot in terms of making a prediction. And as far as the run game goes, I mean, if you look at the last five games, the Packers are averaging over 140 rushing yards per game, 4.9 yards per carry, success rate down below 39%. So struggling to move the chains on the ground. And inversely, if you look at the Bears' run defense in the last five games, they're allowing 143 rushing yards per game, 5.18 yards per carry. But look at the success rate. 33.5% success rate per rush is excellent. So they're not allowing opponents to move the chains on the ground. Despite getting run on, opponents are not able to move the chains on the ground. So that actually might not be a bad matchup for Chicago. This is a defense that struggles against the run. But if the Packers aren't moving the chains on the ground... Jordan Love, we just talked about his completion percentage against cover three. Maybe he's not consistently connecting on throws, relying on the big plays. 
I don't know. I think the Bears defense can show up in this one. I, th I think Jordan Love may struggle. I don't know if the run game is going to be there consistently. I kind of like the matchup for the Bears defense, even though they haven't looked all that great in the last handful of games. But what about on the other side of the ball? Let's take a look at the matchup for the Bears offense and talk about difficulty in making a prediction. I mean, First of all, the Bears offense is 31st in yards per play, 27th in success rate. So this offense is not good. 26th in yards per pass to them, 26th in success rate per drop back. About the same on the ground, 28th and 24th. Packers defense has been pretty good. I mean, obviously, this looks like a favorable matchup for Green Bay defensively. If we pull up the numbers from the last five games for the Bears offense, I mean... What the hell are we doing here? How are we supposed to make a prediction with this? In their last two games against Arizona and New England, not even good defenses, they're averaging six points per game. Six points per game, 4.2 yards per play, success rate below 37%. Absolutely terrible offense in their last two games. In the three games before that, the offense was looking good. 28.7 points per game, 6.5 yards per play, success rate over 51%. What are we supposed to do with this data? We're talking about extreme data points here. The Bears offense was looking good as hell for three games, and then it looks like the worst offense in the NFL in the last two games. Then on top of that, you throw in that they fired their offensive coordinator, and we have a new play caller there in Chicago. So <laughs> as far as making a prediction of what we're going to see from the Bears offense, Good luck, man. I have no idea. Now, one thing we do have to point out about the Packers defense against the pass. Yardage looks okay. Yards per attempt looks okay. Passer rating, eh. Look at the success rate. 57.5% success rate per drop back. The Packers defense will give you underneath throws all game. You can move the chains through the air via short passes against this Packers defense nonstop. They sit back in coverage. They will give you underneath throws. Check this out. Green Bay, 30th in DVOA against the short pass. One of the worst defenses in the NFL against the short pass because they sit back in coverage. They will give you those underneath throws. As I'm sure you already know, Caleb Williams not having the best season, specifically the last two games were a nightmare. Want to know what his most efficient passing depth is, though? The short pass, his numbers actually look pretty good throwing the short pass. The Packers defense gives you those underneath throws, and Caleb Williams has been very efficient making those throws. So there is a path to Caleb Williams moving the chains and getting the ball up and down the field in this game through the air. Now, will he have run support? I'd have to say probably not. Green Bay in the last four games allowing 4.2 yards per carry, 112.3 rushing yards per game, 34% success rate per rush. So just like the Bears defense, the Packers are not letting you move the chains on the ground. And kind of the same thing with the Bears offense. Five yards per carry, 125 rushing yards per game in their last four, but... 34.8% success rate per rush. So they're not moving the chains on the ground either. So I doubt Caleb Williams is going to have run support in this game. But like I said, there is a path. Those underneath throws are going to be there for Caleb Williams. If you trust him to just continue making those throws, moving the ball down the field without making mistakes, I mean, there is a path. I keep saying there is a path because there is one. Um, now, as far as the Bears run game goes, they're, they run the fifth most gap concept blocking schemes. Kind of plays into the strength of the Packers defense. They're 10th in yards per carry allowed, 11th in success rate per rush against gap concept blocking schemes. But again, they have a new OC calling the plays. So who even knows if that's what we're going to see? Uh, this is probably a moot point here. Overall, on this side of the ball, definitely a lot of question marks with the new play caller. Obviously, the Bears offense has looked terrible. They're at home where they have been better. <laughs> really tough to make a prediction on this side. I do think Caleb Williams is able to move the chains with those underneath throws. I do think the Bears will put up some points. What makes betting this game difficult is the question marks on the other side as well. Will Jordan Love connect on those big plays? Because we know those opportunities are going to be there, but those big plays, like I said before, they're very volatile, very hit or miss. If those big plays aren't there, Packers offense could be in a situation. Personally, I don't think this number should be bigger than three and a half in Chicago. The Bears have been very good at home this year, minus their last game. So I'm taking it. I'll take the Bears plus five and a half. Do I absolutely love it? No. But like I said, if those big plays aren't there for Jordan Love, this should be a close game. So give me the Bears plus five and a half. Also, the total's at 40 and a half. Lower total. Expecting a lower scoring game. Favors the underdog, I guess. <laughs> give me the Bears plus five and a half next game. Next up is Baltimore-Pittsburgh. Already recorded this one early in the week. You might have already seen it. If you haven't, here it is. All right, like I said, Baltimore's on the road in Pittsburgh for this one. The Steelers are catching three. It looks like all the three and a halves are gone. This one was at three and a half, but they are long gone. We're looking at three across the board here. Total sitting at 48 and a half, or actually I'm seeing a lot of 48s now. So let's go ahead and get into this matchup, and we'll start with some head-to-head -head history. Pittsburgh's had no problems playing this Ravens team in Baltimore. In their last seven trips to Baltimore, they're 6-1 and one straight up and 6-1 and one against the spread. 
at home, however, just five and five straight up, two, six and two against the spread. So in this head-to-head -head rivalry, the road team has been more successful. However, in terms of recent history, it's been all Steelers. They're six and two against the spread in their last eight matchups against the Ravens, seven and one straight up. Asterisk here, Lamar Jackson has sat out a lot of these games. Lamar Jackson only has four career starts against the Steelers, surprisingly enough. He's only played four games against Pittsburgh in his career somehow. Uh, but yeah, in the last eight matchups, it's been all Steelers. The Steelers are the Achilles heel of the Baltimore Ravens. This game is going to be a battle of grit. Prop Ever even went as far to call it a grid off. So what do we think about this matchup? We'll start with the Ravens offense against the Steelers defense. Pretty elite matchup here. Baltimore offensively, first in yards per play, first in success rate, first in EPA, first in DVOA, first across the board in terms of passing numbers, pretty much first in rushing as well. I mean, first, fourth, third, and second. So on paper, this has been the best offense in the NFL so far this season, but they're going to have their hands full here on the road in Pittsburgh because the Steelers defense is not a joke. Seventh in yards per play allowed, 10th in success rate. Look at their numbers against the run. Third in yards per carry, 11th in success rate per rush, fifth in EPA, ninth in DVOA. Pretty damn good numbers against the pass as well. So this is going to be a pretty elite matchup here. We'll start with this angle right here. The Steelers defense does not blitz. They're 28th in blitz rate. Lamar Jackson significantly better when not blitzed. First in yards per attempt, first in pass rating, 12th in big time throw rate, fifth in turnover worthy play rate when not blitzed. So you look at these numbers and this seems like a positive angle for Lamar Jackson. But the thing is, look at the right side of this graphic. Steelers, 30th in pressure rate. Now that doesn't make sense. How are the Steelers 30th in pressure rate? Check this out. So opposing quarterbacks against the Steelers are getting rid of the football in just 2.38 seconds per drop back, which is the fastest in the NFL. If you look at the Steelers' time to pressure, it's also 2.38 seconds exactly, which is fourth in the NFL. So that graphic before says the Steelers are 30th in pressure rate. Yes, that's true. They don't record a lot of pressures because teams come in and literally game plan on getting rid of the ball quickly. The Steelers' pass rush is so good that opposing quarterbacks, opposing offenses come in with a specific game plan to get the ball out fast. Why is that so important? Well, because Lamar Jackson averages 4.41 seconds before he throws the ball 38th amongst 38 qualified quarterbacks so no quarterback in the nfl holds on to the ball longer than lamar jackson so lamar jackson averages 4.41 seconds before he releases the football steelers average 2.38 seconds before their pressure gets there that's not going to work lamar jackson is releasing the football over two seconds after the steelers pressure arrived so we look at this graphic again lamar jackson's excellent when not blitzed but the steelers defense might be a rare exception yeah they don't blitz a lot but they're still getting to the quarterback in 2.38 seconds one of the fastest in the nfl and they're doing it without sending extra rushers so although you look at this and this might look like a positive angle for lamar jackson i don't like it which is why he has really really struggled against the Steelers. Through his four career starts against the Steelers, he's completing just 58.8% of his passes, four touchdowns to seven interceptions. He's getting sacked an average of five times a game, taking five sacks a game in his four starts against the, uh, against the Steelers, an average pass rating of 66.3. So he's been terrible in his games against the Steelers. This pass rush always gives Lamar Jackson problems because he holds onto the football for so long. Now, the good news for Lamar Jackson Alex Highsmith is out. So you might be looking at that thinking, okay, they can now double team TJ Watt. But hold on, the Steelers just added Preston Smith. So I don't know if they're able to double team TJ Watt in this one. Preston Smith's pretty good. So even though Alex Highsmith is out and that hurts, the Steelers pass rush is still going to be a problem. Now, I do have some good news for you if you're trying to back Lamar Jackson in this game. Steelers defense runs a lot of cover three, 44.1% of the time. That's third most in the NFL. Lamar Jackson might be the best quarterback in the NFL throwing the ball in cover three. 10th in completion percentage, first in yards per pass attempt, first in passer rating. So he has carved up cover three. What happened the last time Lamar Jackson saw a defense that ran a shitload of cover three? It was the Tampa Bay Bucks. They're second in cover three frequency. Lamar Jackson went absolutely nuclear in that matchup. 17 of 22, 281 yards, five touchdowns, passer rating over 158 looking like a college football passer rating there. So the Steelers run a ton of cover three. Lamar Jackson, excellent numbers against cover three. The last time he saw a defense that runs cover three, he went off. Here's the problem with that. Bucks don't have a pass rush. Steelers have arguably the best pass rush in the NFL. Is Lamar Jackson going to have the time to carve up this cover three? Another question we have to ask 
is Lamar Jackson going to have run support in this game? Now, I will say I'm not too worried about the last two games. I mean, the last two games, Baltimore's rushing attack didn't look great. Just 114 rushing yards per game. Success rate per rush under 40%. 3.9 yards per carry. That was against Denver and Cincinnati. I'm not too worried about two games. We've seen this rushing attack look absolutely dominant. In their first eight games, they're averaging 200 rushing yards a game. So I'm not really concerned with the last two games. That being said, nobody is running the ball in the Pittsburgh Steelers this year. In the last five games, they're allowing just 87.4 rushing yards per game, 3.9 yards per carry, success rate per rush down at 41.1%. The addition of Patrick Queen to that defense was perfect. This is one of the best run defenses in the NFL. So I don't expect the Ravens to snap their little rushing slump that they've been in for the last couple of games here. Steelers should be able to stop the Ravens rushing attack. Another thing, Baltimore does a lot of gap concept blocking schemes, 10th most in the NFL. That plays directly into the strength of the Steelers defense. They're actually one of the best defenses in the NFL when it comes to gap concept blocking schemes, second in yards per carry, second in success rate. So as a whole on this side of the ball, I know the Ravens have looked like the best offense in the NFL so far this year. I don't like this matchup at all for him. I mean, this is a Steelers defense that always seems to give Lamar Jackson all types of problems. I don't know if the run game is going to be there. This is a pretty tough matchup for the Ravens offensively. But what about on the other side? Let's talk about the matchup for the Steelers offense, who should also be in a situation here. Steelers offensively, they have looked better recently with Russell Wilson. Still just 20th in yards per play, 19th in success rate. The run game for the Steelers has been really disappointing this year. 23rd in yards per carry, 22nd in success rate per rush. After what we saw the second half of last year, adding Arthur Smith, we expected the Steelers to have a dramatically improved rushing attack this year, and it just hasn't been there, and it's probably not going to be there in this one. The offensive line is still banged up, and the Ravens probably are the best run defense in the NFL. They're first in yards per carry allowed, first in success rate per rush. The Steelers' battered offensive line is dramatically outmatched here. If you look at the offensive line metrics for the Steelers in comparison to the defensive line metrics for the Ravens, I mean, it's not even a discussion. I don't know how this injured Steelers offensive line is able to generate push in this game. And like I said, the Steelers are still dealing with these injuries. There's still no James Daniels at right guard. There's still no Fal Faltanu. I always say his name wrong. There's still no Faltanu at right tackle. Also, Najee Harris might not even play in this game. He's listed as questionable. So I don't know how we're expecting the Steelers to run the ball in this game. They haven't been able to really run the ball all year, and, the, and nobody's running the ball on Baltimore. Now, the good news, Michael Pierce is still out for Baltimore, but still, even without Michael Pierce, this Ravens defensive line, the defensive front is just loaded, very physical. The Steelers aren't going to be able to run the ball in this game. Now, what about the matchup for Russell Wilson throwing the ball? All right, so we'll start with this graphic right here. Russell Wilson's numbers against two high safety looks versus single high safety looks. As you can see, dramatically better against single high safety looks. 29th in completion percentage, second in yards per, uh, yards per pass attempt, second in passer rating, first in big time throw rate. So he's made a lot of big throws against single high safety looks. Against two high safety looks, it's been the exact opposite. Look at the big time throw rate. First for single high safety looks, 42nd, well tied for 42nd versus two high safety looks. That's amongst 42 qualified quarterbacks. So that's dead last. First against single high safety looks, tied for dead last against two high safety looks. The Ravens run two high safety looks at a 47% frequency. That's 10th most in the NFL. And you might be looking at this saying, Kyle, 10th, that's like slightly above league average. That's not even a lot. Well, Russell Wilson's two starts so far were against the Jets and the Giants both top 10 in single high safety frequency. So although the Ravens don't run a ton of two high safety looks, they're 10th, 47%, it's still a lot more than Russell Wilson has seen up until this point, and he's been pretty bad against two high safety looks. Also, just like the Pittsburgh Steelers, Baltimore doesn't blitz much. Just 20th in blitz rate so far this year, Russell Wilson significantly better when blitzed. First in yards per pass attempt, 10th in PFF passer grade, first in big time throw rate, second in passer rating when blitzed. When he's not blitzed, the numbers don't look good at all. 16th, 30th, 39th, and 14th. So up to this point, looking like a rough matchup for Russell Wilson. That being said, I do have some positive angles for Russell Wilson in this game. So if you're betting the Steelers or plan on betting the Steelers, I have something for you here. Russell Wilson throws a beautiful deep pass, and that's dating back to his days with Seattle. He throws it a lot, too. 17.6% of Russell Wilson's pass attempts this year have been considered deep passes. That's a lot. That might be the most in the NFL. He throws the deep ball a lot. That plays directly into the weakness of this Baltimore defense. They have really struggled limiting the big downfield passes, and Russell Wilson 
Wilson throws a lot of them, and he's very accurate with it. Look at his DVOA, his pass rating on those deep passes towards the top of the NFL. So you definitely don't like that if you plan on betting Baltimore here. Also, Baltimore does not generate a lot of pressure. Baltimore does not have the best pass rush. They're just 20th in pressure rate so far this year. Look at Russell Wilson's numbers this year when given a clean pocket. He's been one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL, granted a very small sample size. When given a clean pocket, he's fifth in yards per attempt, second in passer rating, first in turnover-worthy play rate at 0%. He hasn't thrown a single turnover-worthy play. A play includes throws and potential fumbles. 0% turnover-worthy play rate when given a clean pocket. Russell Wilson has been an assassin from a clean pocket. And like I said, Ravens do not have the best pass rush. Now, the Steelers' offensive line isn't great, so I'm sure they will be able to generate some pressure but no question, Russell Wilson is going to have some clean th uh, clean pockets to throw from in this game. He likes to throw the deep ball, and the Ravens have struggled against the deep pass. So if you're betting Baltimore, you definitely don't like that. That being said, I think Harbaugh is going to be prepared for that with the battered offensive line from the Steelers. The run game is not much of a threat. So I think Harbaugh is going to be prepared to limit those big throws downfield personally. As a whole on this side of the ball, if I'm being honest, I don't really like the matchup for the Steelers offense. The run game's going to be non-existent. Sure, Russell Wilson is going to have opportunities to make some throws, and I'm sure he makes some of them. But as a whole, I don't think the Steelers are going to be able to consistently move the ball up and down the field on the Ravens, which brings us to the bet. How about a trend first? Seven straight unders. Like I said, this is the battle of the grit. This is a grit battle here. Seven straight unders in Baltimore-Pittsburgh game. So why are we betting against the trend? I'm not. I'm in. Seven straight unders, I'm in. Give me the under at 48 and a half. Now, if I'm being honest, I'm not betting the under because of the trend. I kind of could care less about the trend. I truly do like the matchup for both of these defenses. I think both offenses are really going to struggle to run the ball. I think both offenses are going to try to stay diligent and run the ball. So I expect the clock to be running a lot of punts. I think it's an under game. Honestly, 48 and a half is a crazy total for a Ravens Steelers game. I do understand why the total's so high. And I also understand your hesitation of betting an under in a Baltimore Ravens game. They're like seven and one to the over this year. But this particular matchup, it's always a grit battle. It's the grit off. Give me the under 48 and a half. Also, chance of rain. I say this a little bit tongue in cheek. I don't think it's going to rain. It's like a 15% chance. Just throwing it out there. I'm recording this on Tuesday night. Maybe as we get closer to the weekend, the weather changes. If I get some rain, I would love an under at 48 and a half. Uh, but I already bet it. I'm in. Give me the under 48 and a half. We got Atlanta on the road in Denver. The Broncos are laying two points at home here in the total sitting at 44 and a half. I do see a couple 44s out there. Mostly 44 and a half, though. Let's take a look at the pie charts. And according to the data, actions coming in on the Atlanta side, over 60% of the tickets, about 55% of the money. But as I always say, take this data with a grain of salt. So let's get into this one. And we'll start with the fact that Atlanta's had some success against this Denver team. In their last five matchups, they're four and one straight up against the Broncos and four and one against the number. So if you've been betting Atlanta when they played Denver, you are turning a profit. Uh, but we're not interested in the past. Let's talk about this matchup right here. We'll start with the Falcons offense, specifically the Falcons rushing attack. Because in the last five games, they seem to have gotten their shit together a bit. 156 rushing yards per game, 5.1 yards per carry, 54% success rate per rush. Compare those numbers to the first five games where they were struggling to run the ball. And you'd think, hey, Falcons run game coming along. Falcons have themselves a rushing attack here. But we do have to take into consideration the opponents. In the first five games, they saw Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Kansas City. They saw the Bucs and Saints also, but they also saw the Bucs and Saints uh, in the second five games as well. Look at week six through 10, Carolina, Seattle, Dallas. Dallas, one of the worst run defenses in the NFL, and Carolina, probably the worst run defense in the NFL. So is the Falcons rushing attack coming along, or have they just played an easier schedule? Probably a bit of both, um, but it's definitely good to see the Falcons running the ball as of late. Can we count on the run game being there in this one, though? I'm not so sure. On the road in Denver, the Broncos defense has been good as hell this year. They're actually first in the NFL in yards per play allowed, fifth in success rate. Numbers against the run, they're fifth in yards per carry allowed, 12th in success rate per rush, 14th in EPA, 6th in DVOA. So this has been an excellent defense overall, slightly better against the pass, but still, they've got some great numbers against the run as well. The battle on the line of scrimmage is going to be serious. Look at the Falcons offensive line, seventh in adjusted line yards, third in run blocking grade, eighth in yards before contact. Denver's defensive line, ninth, fifth, and first. So somebody's got to win the battle in the trenches, man. This is a pretty good matchup here. I will say Atlanta's numbers against top 10 run defenses, though, 
I mean, 4.4 yards per carry is pretty good, but 38% success rate per rush is definitely not good. So they've done a lot of their rushing damage against some bad defenses. Denver is most definitely not a bad defense. In fact, in their last three games, they're allowing less than 85 rushing yards per game, 3.5 yards per carry, success rate per rush at 31.2%. Yes, Carolina's in there, but so is Baltimore and Kansas City, although the Chiefs have been struggling to run the ball. But the Ravens are in there, the best rushing attack in the entire NFL. So although the Falcons have been getting the run game going in their last five games, they played a relatively easy schedule and on the road in Denver against this defensive front. I don't know how much we can count on the Falcons running the ball in this game. I think Denver's defensive front is able to give them some problems. So I don't know if I like the matchup for the Falcons run game, but what about the matchup for Kirk Cousins? Let's take a look at the Broncos coverages. A lot of man coverage, a lot of cover one, a lot of single high safety looks. Let's take a look at Kirk Cousins' numbers against those coverages. He's actually got better numbers against man, so good start here for Kirk Cousins. 15th, 11th, and 21st against zone. Against man, 6th, 9th, and 13th, so really nothing there. Slightly better against man coverage. But when we get to his numbers against cover one, a little concerning. 19th in completion percentage, 15th in pass rating, pretty average. 25th in big time throw rate, 32nd in turnover worthy play rate. So not the best numbers here against cover one. And when you look at his numbers against single high safety looks, it's kind of the same thing. Much better numbers against two high safety looks. Although cover one and single high safety looks, the, <laughs> we're talking about mostly the same plays here. Those two go hand in hand, uh, but not the best matchup on paper here for Kirk Cousins. And it actually gets worse because what does Denver do a lot of blitz? They're second in the NFL in blitz rate, second in adjusted sack rate. So they're coming for Kirk Cousins and Kirk Cousins is much better when not blitzed. Completion percentage, yards per attempt, PFF passer grade and passer rating when blitzed, 22nd, 14th, 23rd, 19th, when not blitzed, 4th, 7th, 12th, and 7th. So when he's not blitzed, Kirk Cousins is a borderline top 10 quarterback in the NFL. When he's blitzed, most definitely not. And speaking of the Broncos blitzing and putting pressure on Kirk Cousins, that's another thing I want to point out here. Let's pull up the Falcons game logs. When's the last time they saw a legitimate pass rush? They opened up the season against the Steelers, Eagles, Chiefs, weeks one, two, three. Since then, they've played the Saints twice. The Saints defense has been a mess this year. They've played the Bucks twice. The Bucks defense looks terrible. That might be a bottom six or seven defense in the NFL. They played Carolina, Seattle, although the Seahawks defense is improving as of late. But for most of the year, that Seahawks defense was also a mess. And the Cowboys, I don't even have to go into the Cowboys defense. You know what's going on with that. It's been absolutely terrible. So since that Chiefs game in week three, they've played nothing but terrible defenses here. This Falcons offense and Kirk Cousins struggles against the blitz. He struggles against pressure. When's the last time he even saw a defensive front capable of putting pressure on him? It's been a while. It's been like two months. Take a look at the Falcons numbers against bottom 12 defenses. That's Tampa Bay twice, Carolina and Dallas. 33 points per game, 7 yards per play, over 53% success rate, 308 passing yards per game, 8.8 .8 yards per attempt, pass rating of 126.2, over 56% success rate per drop back. This Falcons offense and Kirk Cousins is racking up these killer stats against some really, really bad defenses, which is why, just like I said about the Falcons run game, I think this road game against Denver is a wake-up call for Kirk Cousins and the passing attack as well. They're going to be sending blitzes. This Falcons offensive line has been very good. Like I said before, they haven't seen a decent pass rush in two months. I think this is a wake-up call. I think that Broncos pass rush is going to be a problem in this game. But what about the other side of the ball? Let's take a look at the matchup for Denver's offense. <laughs> the Denver offense against the Falcons defense. Neither of these units have been particularly good. Denver's 22nd in yards per play, 22nd in success rate. The Falcons' defense is 18th and 26th. So like I said, both of these units flirting with the idea of being bottom 10, bottom 12 in the NFL. The Broncos do have some decent looking rushing numbers. They're 14th in yards per carry, 14th in success rate per rush against a Falcons defense that struggled to stop the run. So on paper, the Broncos should be able to run the ball. But honestly, I'm a little concerned with the Broncos rushing attack. In the last three games, they're averaging just 3.7 yards per carry as a team. 27.8% success rate per rush is terrible. They've really been struggling to run the ball in their last three games. Now, two of those games were against Baltimore and Kansas City two top three or four run defenses in the NFL. So we can cut them a little bit of slack. They've seen two of the best run defenses in the NFL recently. But in comparison to the rushing production we were seeing from Denver in weeks three through seven, 143.6 rushing yards per game, 5.4 yards per carry. This Denver run game was looking pretty good. Definitely not a great look here to see this Broncos run game come crashing back down to earth. Now, maybe at home against a bad Falcons run defense, maybe the Broncos run game can bounce back. Now, we do have to give the Falcons some credit. Last week against the Saints, they actually 
actually played a great defensive game against the run. It's the Saints with a completely crushed offensive line. One of the worst offensive lines in the NFL right now with the injuries. But still, held him to 97 rushing yards, 3.7 yards per carry, 34.6% success rate per rush. So they did just play a great defensive game against the run. But look at the eight games before that. In the previous eight games, this is not a small sample size. They were allowing five yards per carry, over 134 rushing yards per game, 44% success rate per rush. So we know this is not a good run defense. I don't have a ton of faith in the Broncos run game, but at home against the Falcons defensive front, I think the Broncos should be able to run the ball a little bit in this game. The question is, will Bo Nix be able to throw the ball? What do we think about this matchup for Bo Nix? Uh, well, the Falcons run a lot of zone coverage. They're six in zone frequency, seventh and two high safety frequency. So a lot of zone coverage, a lot of cover two, a lot of two high safety looks. Bo Nix, not great numbers against zone. In fact, they're pretty awful. 28th in completion percentage, 30, 30 yards per attempt, 29th in pass rating, 34th in big time throw rate against zone coverage. Not a great start here for Bo Nix. What about his numbers against two high safeties? Well, equally as bad. 26th in completion percentage, 36 in yards per attempt, 31st in pass rating, 33rd in big type throw rate. So Bo Nix, pretty awful looking numbers against zone coverage, pretty awful looking numbers against two high safety looks. Not a great start here for Bo Nix. And it actually gets slightly worse than that. What's Bo Nix's strongest passing depth? The deep pass, and he throws it a lot, 14.5% of the time. That happens to play directly into the strength of this Falcons defense. The deep pass is their strongest passing depth defensively. So definitely not a great look here for Bo Nix. That being said, I do have some positive angles here for Bo Nix. Number one, Atlanta does not pressure the passer at all. In fact, they're dead last in adjusted sack rate, 32nd, 26th in pressure rate. Bo Nix has terrible numbers when pressured. Four yards per pass attempt, that's 38th in the NFL. Four yards per pass attempt under pressure, a 52 passer rating when pressured. Now, not that his numbers when given a clean pocket are excellent, but his yards per attempt goes from a four to a 6.8. His passer rating goes from a 52 to a 93. So significantly better when given a clean pocket. He should have plenty of them in this game because like I said, the Falcons generate no pressure and the Denver offensive line has done a great job in pass protection. Their 18th in pressure rate allowed, second in pass blocking grade, fifth in adjusted sack rate. So Bo Nick should have plenty of clean pockets to throw from in this game. And also we're at home in Denver where Bo Nick's passing numbers are much, much better in his home games, over 245 passing yards per game, 7.4 yards per attempt, 96.8 average passer rating, 52.1% success rate per drop back. Great looking numbers for Bo Nix throwing the ball at home. That being said, Panthers, Raiders, those were his two good games against the Panthers and Raiders. Against the Steelers and Chargers, I mean, he didn't play particularly great. He wasn't terrible, uh, but still, if you're betting the Broncos in this game, you love to see it. You love to see that he plays better at home in mile high. And another positive angle for Bo Nix, the Falcons secondary is in trouble here. Mike Hughes is out. D. Alford is out. Also, Antonio Hamilton, that's another one of their corners that sees the field. He's out. They have a safety. Their third safety is out. The Falcons have all kinds of injuries to their defense. There's only two listed here on this depth chart because there's only two starters out, but they're missing a linebacker. They're missing a couple pieces on the defensive line. They have serious injuries to the depth of their defense. So this Atlanta defense is definitely thin right now, especially at the cornerback position. So there actually are a decent amount of positive angles here for Bo Nix. Is he gonna throw the ball on the Falcons defense? I honestly think he might. And speaking of injuries, Broncos offense is at full strength. No injury designations to the Broncos offense. They're completely good to go, which is why I am on Denver for this one. I took the money line. I paid minus 130 juice for it. Maybe not the smartest decision, but I like the matchup for the Broncos in this one. I like the matchup specifically for the Broncos defense. The Falcons have been playing so many bad defenses on the road against Denver. This should be a wake-up call for that offensive line and Kirk Cousins. And on the offensive side, do I like the Broncos to just go off offensively? No, but the Falcons defense hasn't been good at all. Bo Nix has been better at home. They're healthy. So I like the Broncos here. I'm on the money line. Give me Denver money line next game. Next up is Chiefs Bills in Buffalo. Uh, this is another one that I recorded earlier in the week. You might have seen it. I uploaded it, I think, on Wednesday. Uh, here it is. All right. Like I said, Chiefs are on the road in Buffalo for this one. The Bills are laying two or two and a half. I see twos. I see two and a halfs, uh, depending on your sports book. Total sitting at 46. I do see now nah, pretty much 46 uh, for the total. Let's take a look at the pie charts. And according to the data, action seems to be coming pretty heavily in on the Kansas City side. Over 80% of the tickets, over 70% of the money. As I always say, 
take this data with a grain of salt. So let's get into this one and we'll start with some trends. And if you're betting the Chiefs, you're going to like these. Um, as an underdog since 2018, Kansas City is 13-3-1 against the number so if you've been blindly betting the chiefs every time they're dogs you're considerably up <laughs> also check this out when they're on the road as underdogs 11 0 and 1 against the number so definitely a, definitely a favorable trend there if you like kansas city another trend that favors the chiefs here the road team has been very successful in this chiefs bills rivalry in the last four chiefs bills game in kansas city the bills are three and one against the number and three and one straight up the last four matchups in buffalo the chiefs are four and oh straight up and four and oh against the number so the road team has been the side to be on in this head-to-head -head rivalry uh, but we are not interested in the past we're talking about this matchup right now so let's get into it. We'll start with the Kansas City offense against the Buffalo defense. These two units are pretty evenly matched on paper. I mean, we know the story when it comes to the Chiefs offense. They don't load up the stat sheet. They're not putting up amazing fantasy football scores. But look at the success rate. Second in overall success rates. Uh, fourth in success rate per dropback. Second in success rate per rush. They move the chains. They don't get off the field. They stay on the field. They keep the drive moving. That's what makes them so great this year matched up against the bills defense that's been pretty solid i mean it's not top five defense or anything but it's probably close to being a top 10 top 12 defense in the nfl they're 15th in yards per play 12th in success rate 9th in yards per pass attempt allowed 20th in success rate per drop back 30th in yards per carry allowed but check this out sixth in success rate per rush uh so this like i said this this bills defense has been pretty solid the question i have here is Kansas City going to be able to run the ball in this game? Because Kareem Hunt joined the team, and for a few games, shit was looking sweet. It was like, ah, Kareem Hunt's in midseason form. It was like he never left. They were averaging 144 rushing yards per game, four and a half yards per carry, success rate per rush over 45%. But then look at his last three games. 88.7 rushing yards per game, 3.3 yards per carry, 33.2 percent success rate per rush so the last three games the run game hasn't really been there and look at the opponents denver okay denver's got a tough defensive front but tampa bay the raiders i mean these are not good run defenses so the chiefs run game it looked like cream hunt saved it for a few weeks there but i don't have a ton of faith in it right now and they're matched up against a buffalo run defense on the year they don't have the most impressive numbers but look at the last four games they're allowing less than 99 rushing yards per game 4.27 yards per carry but check out the success rate 32.8 percent they do not let you move the chains on the ground we just talked about how that's what the chiefs excel at moving the chains so we're off to a pretty solid start here if you like the bills chiefs run game has not been very efficient bills have been playing the run well I don't know if the Chiefs are going to be able to run the ball in this one. Now, you can point at this if you like the Chiefs to run the ball in this game. They actually lead the league in yards per carry out of gap concept blocking schemes, and they run a lot of those. That happens to play into the weakness of this Bills run defense. They're much stronger against zone blocking schemes. It's pretty thin. I personally don't think there's enough evidence here to warrant the Chiefs running, ball, running the ball in this game. But, I mean, it's something. If you're looking for something. Another thing you can point at if you like the Chiefs to run the ball is the fact that the offensive line is completely healthy. Obviously, there's no Pacheco. There's still no Rasheed Rice. But the starting five on the offensive line are completely healthy for the Chiefs. That being said, I mean, Buffalo's defensive front is in pretty good shape also. They are missing Milano, obviously. He's been out forever. Uh, Inspector's going to miss this one as well. So they're missing a linebacker, but Buffalo's got one of the best defensive lines in the entire NFL. And also, Von Miller's not even pictured in this graphic. They have Von Miller coming off the bench as well. So I, I don't know. I personally don't think the Chiefs are going to be able to run the ball in this game. So why don't we take a look at the matchup for Patrick Mahomes against this Bills secondary? Uh, he does have great career numbers against this Buffalo team completing over 68 percent of his passes this is in seven career starts against the bills uh completing over 68 percent of his passes 289.1 yards per game 15 touchdowns the to five picks a 101.3 passer rating so solid career numbers against the bills and actually he's been more efficient against the bills in his two road games of the seven career starts against buffalo only two of them have been on the road in buffalo in those two games he completed over 77 percent of his passes just 220 yards per game which is weird because in those two games the chiefs were able to run the ball efficiently that's actually interesting one was clyde edwards hilaire back in 2020 and then the playoff game uh pacheco had a big game running the ball so both of mahomes road games against the bills the chiefs offense was leaning on the run game and we just went through it i don't know if the chiefs are going to be able to run the ball in this one so in these two road games against buffalo mahomes dropped back to pass i think it was 23 times and 26 times he may have to drop back to pass more than that in this one uh, but regardless he was incredibly efficient 
in these two road games against Buffalo. Four touchdowns, no picks, a 131.3 passer rating. So he's had no problems making throws on this Bills team in the past. As far as the coverage matchup, uh, the Bills are eighth in zone frequency, ninth in cover two frequency, fourth in two high safety frequency. So a decent amount of cover two, decent amount of zone, a lot of two high safety looks. Let's take a look at Mahomes' numbers against those coverages. Uh, slightly better against man this year, which is actually the opposite of what it was last year. Uh, so the Bills run a decent amount of zone. Mahomes slightly better against man, slightly worse against zone. Nothing really there, kind of thin. Uh, what about cover two? Patrick Mahomes against cover two amongst 41 qualified quarterbacks this year. 16th in completion percentage, 21st in yards per attempt, 26th in pass rating. So okay, struggles a little bit against cover two. Bills run a lot of cover two, there's something. What about two high safety looks? 22nd in completion percentage, 25th in yards per attempt, 30th in passer rating. So struggles against two high safety looks. Maybe not the best matchup on paper for Patrick Mahomes here, especially when we don't know if he's going to have run support. And this is a Buffalo defense that's been playing solid defense against the pass. In their last four games, they're allowing just 232.5 passing yards per game, 7.1 yards per attempt. Look where they struggle, though. Success rate, the Chiefs specialty, getting off the field. That's where the Bills struggle. 58.4% success rate per dropback is actually bad. So although it's a bad matchup on paper for Patrick Mahomes, although the Bills have been playing solid defense against the pass, I still think Mahomes and the Chiefs offense are going to find ways to move the chains because they always do. It's not always pretty, but they find ways to stay on the field and keep the chains moving. Overall, on this side of the field, though, I do think the Chiefs offense might be in a bit of trouble here like we just went through. This is a tough matchup on paper. I'm sure they'll find ways to get the ball down the field and put points up, but... I wouldn't be surprised if the Chiefs offense is struggling for uh, through a lot of this game. But what about the matchup on the other side? Let's take a look at the matchup for the Bills offense. Uh, definitely a top 10 offense, maybe even a top five offense. Eighth in yards per play, seventh in success rate. As far as passing, 10th in yards per pass attempt, eighth in success rate per dropback. Rushing, 14th in yards per carry, ninth in success rate per rush. Second, third, and third in EPA. This is a very efficient Bills offense. Obviously, we know this is a Bills offense that wants to run the ball first, which could definitely be crucial in this matchup because the Chiefs defense is elite against the run. They have one of the best run defenses in the NFL. Kansas City this year, second in yards per carry allowed, third in success rate per rush, fourth in EPA, third in DVOA against the run. So not a great look there for the Bills. We know Joe Brady wants to run the ball. Are they going to be able to against this elite Chiefs run defense? Well, if we look at the matchup in the trenches here, it's going to be tough. Look at the Chiefs defensive line. They're sixth in adjusted line yards, fourth in run defense grade, third in yards before contact. I don't know if Buffalo is going to be able to generate consistent push in this game. So which of these two units is going to give here? In the last three games, Kansas City is allowing 3.3 yards per carry as a team. 24.1% success rate per rush is crazy. Nobody's moving the chains against Kansas City on the ground. Just 69 rushing yards allowed per game. And yeah, I know the Raiders are in there, but Denver's been running the ball a little bit and the Bucks have been running the shit out of the ball. So this Chiefs run defense is on fire right now. But look at the right side of this graphic. The Bills in their last three games, five yards per carry as a team, over 132 rushing yards per game, 45.7% success rate per rush. So which of these is going to give here? Are the Bills going to be able to run the ball or not? Really tough to make a call. So why don't we look at the matchup for Josh Allen and the Bills passing attack? Uh, well, just like Patrick Mahomes, he's done well in this rivalry. I guess we can call it a rivalry. They've had some big games um, in his career against the Chiefs. Over 61% completions, over 257 yards per game, 16 touchdowns, three interceptions, a 98.3 pass rating. So he's played well against the Chiefs, just like Mahomes has played well against the Bills. Chiefs run a lot of man coverage, 36.6% of the time. That's sixth most in the NFL. Josh Allen, better numbers against man coverage, 10th, 6th, and 12th in yards per attempt, passer rating, turnover worthy play rate, better than against zone coverage. So, okay, solid start for Josh Allen. Also, what does Spagnola do? Blitzes a lot. Third in the NFL in blitz rate, so we know the Chiefs are going to be sending blitzes after Josh Allen. Josh Allen, much better when blitzed. Yards per attempt, PFF passer grade, turnover worthy play rate, and passer rating when blitzed. Seventh, tenth, third, and fourth. So a top 10, maybe even a top five quarterback against the blitz when not blitzed. 18th, 18th, 34th, 19th. So, okay, looking like a pretty favorable matchup for Josh Allen. And this Chiefs pass defense, by the way, kind of trending in the wrong direction. In weeks four through seven against the Saints, the Chargers, and the 49ers, they allowed just 191 passing yards per game, 6.2 yards per attempt, an average opponent pass rating of just 68.9. So the Chiefs were playing elite defense against the pass through that little stretch. 
Look at the three games since then against the Bucs, the Broncos, and the Raiders. So it's not like they played elite offenses. I mean, the Bucs are pretty nice, but the Raiders and the Broncos, just 208 passing yards per game, seven yards per attempt, an average opponent pass rating of 116.4, and look at the success rate, 59.1 percent success rate per drop back so this kansas city pass defense like i said definitely trending in the wrong direction and we're talking about josh allen at home in buffalo where he's been a monster on the season at home in buffalo the bills are averaging 264 passing yards per game 8.4 yards per attempt success rate per drop back over 74 percent that is crazy. That's Madden on rookie numbers there. 74.6%, an average pass rating of 123.4. Josh Allen has been a monster at home in Buffalo. So to reiterate everything we just went through, Josh Allen has great history against the Chiefs. Chiefs run man coverage. Josh Allen's better against man coverage. Chiefs blitz a lot. Josh Allen's better against the blitz. Chiefs pass defense has not played well in the last three weeks. And Josh Allen at home, where he's much better. That's a lot of favorable angles for Josh Allen in this spot. Looks like a great matchup for Josh Allen. I like him to have a big game in this one, which is why I know this sounds crazy to fade Patrick Mahomes as an underdog, but I'm doing it. I took the bills in this one. I laid it. Give me Buffalo minus two. I know most of you are going to hate it. I'm on Josh Allen. Bills minus two. Seattle on the road at San Francisco. The 49ers are laying six and a half points at home. Total sitting at 48, pretty much 48 across the board. Take a look at the pie charts. And according to the data, tickets coming in about 50-50. Just over 65% of the money coming in on the 49ers. As I always say, take this data with a grain of salt. So let's get into this matchup. Uh, and I got a bunch of trends here that all point towards Seattle. Uh, first of all, 49ers have not been covering the number. They're just 4-9 against the number in their last 13, just 3-9 and nine ATS in their last 12 home games. So if you've been betting the 49ers, you have not been making money. Next up, Seattle's been much more profitable on the road. Dating back to last season, in their last 14 home games, they're just 4-9-1 against the spread. But in their last 12 road games, 6-4-2 against the spread so this game's in san francisco seattle has been more profitable on the road they've also been more profitable as road dogs in their last five as home dogs they're one and four against the spread but in their last five as road dogs four and one against the spread okay brock purdy has been much better on the road this year and i mean it's not close over 71 percent completions 9.4 yards per attempt nine touchdowns one interception a 120 pass rating on the road look at his numbers at home completing less than 60% of his passes, 8.3 yards per attempt, three touchdowns, six interceptions, pass rating drops from a 120 on the road to a 76 at home. So Brock Purdy's been much better on the road. He's actually struggled in his home game so far this year. And to take it a step further, Seattle's offense, they've actually been much better on the road. In their road games this year, they're averaging 28.7 points per game, six and a half yards per play, over 54% success rate in comparison to their home games where they're averaging just 20.7 points per game look at Geno's passing numbers on the road over 321 passing yards per game 7.5 yards per attempt 63.9 percent success rate per drop back 102 passer rating definitely looking better than his numbers at home now to be fair in his road games he went against the Patriots the Lions who don't have the best secondary and the Falcons that defense has been pretty bad all year so he did play three bad defenses in his road games and if you look at some of the advanced metrics I mean in his home games still a 60 percent success rate per drop back so it's not like he's been bad at home he's just thrown in interceptions in his home games that's pretty much the biggest difference so yeah so far looking like a pretty strong spot to bet seattle here but then we take a bit of a closer look and <laughs> start to get a bit thin for starters the 49ers own seattle they've beaten them six times in a row six and zero straight up in their last six matchups five and one against the number so if you've been blindly betting 49ers against the seahawks you are considerably up in the last few years brock purdy has never had any problems throwing the ball against the seahawks in his career he's made five starts against seattle completing 66 percent of his passes 9.8 yards per attempt 11 touchdowns two interceptions and a 118 passer rating so the seahawks have not been able to stop brock purdy in his career and we mentioned earlier how brock purdy's been struggling at home this season well he he might have snapped that little streak in his first four home starts it was pretty terrible but in his last home start against the cowboys he played well over 69 percent completions 10 yards per attempt a touchdown a 114 passer rating so the whole brock purdy's been terrible at home that might be dead he just he's coming off a great game against the cowboys at home now the seahawks seem to be picking it up in the pass rush department they're up to ninth in pressure rate so the seahawks have been generating some pressure but you know what brock purdy's done a great job handling pressure so far this year check this out 
When pressured, he's 10th in yards per attempt, 5th in passer rating, 12th in turnover-worthy play rate. He's also 8th in pressure to sack rate, so he doesn't take a ton of sacks. So although the Seahawks have been pressuring the passer, I'm not sure how much that moves the needle for me here. Brock Purdy's been great under pressure so far. And Brock Purdy's coming off back-to-back -back huge games. I mentioned the Dallas game, but also the Bucks in Tampa Bay. Over 306 passing yards per game in those two, 10 yards per attempt, over 73%. Success rate per dropback is crazy, an average pass rating of 118.5. So Brock Purdy's been on a little bit of a heater the last couple games, not to mention he had no problems cooking on this Seattle defense back in week six. That was on the road in Seattle, 255 yards, 9.1 yards per attempt, success rate per dropback over 60%, a 129.3 passer rating. So he just cooked on this Seattle defense just four or five weeks ago. I will say though, that game was played without Reek Woolen. Since then, Reek Woolen has returned, and the Seahawks' pass defense has been better. Now, it's not good. Still 58.8% success rate per dropback, which is terrible, but yards per attempt is down, passer rating is down. So now that Reek Woolen is back, he only missed one game, but the last three games, now that he's returned, the Seahawks are playing better defense against the pass. And look at the opponents. The Falcons with Kirk Cousins, the Bills, Josh Allen, and the Rams with Matt Stafford. So we're talking about three straight games against offenses that have good quarterbacks that we know can throw the ball. And I mean, again, they haven't been great, but they haven't been quite as bad as they were in week six. Also, Reek Woolen is not the only piece that was missing from that 49ers game. Julian Love was also banged up. I think he ended up playing, but he was on the injury report all week, missed some practice. Also, Ernest Jones is a new piece here at linebacker. He wasn't there for the first matchup against the 49ers. They were also they also had injuries to the uh, the front seven. I forget who exactly, but they were banged up earlier in the season. So this Seahawks defense, not only did they add Ernest Jones, but they're also much healthier than they were back in week six. And the 49ers offense is dealing with some injuries themselves. Uh, Brandon Ayuk is still out. That's not new. He's been out. Trent Williams, though. Now, I think Aaron Banks and George Kittle are going to play. Both participated in light practice on Friday, but Trent Williams has not practiced all week. I do not have a status update on him, but he missed the entire week of practice. It says not injury related, but it also says ankle on the 49ers injury report. So I don't know what that means. I don't know if Trent Williams is going to play. Obviously, that'd be huge if he was missing from this game. The reason that Trent Williams injury is so crucial is that's a huge mismatch here for the 49ers offense. Look at their offensive line. Second in adjusted line yards, second in run blocking grade, 11th in yards before contact. A huge advantage over the Seattle defensive front that's been getting blown off the line of scrimmage. If they're missing Trent Williams and the Seattle defensive front added Ernest Jones and is healthier than they've been earlier in the season, maybe the gap between these two units is smaller. Not to mention, not only is this Seahawks defense coming off the bye week, but they're also coming off a great game against the Rams. They allowed just 68 rushing yards in the game. 2.8 yards per carry, 29.2% success rate per rush. So you get that great defensive game. You go into the bye week with some momentum and confidence. Who's to say this Seahawks defense, who has talent, who has a great coach in Mike McDonald, who's to say this Seahawks defense isn't turning a corner here? So I don't think it's crazy to say that this Seahawks defense comes out and plays well here on the road in San Francisco. In fact, I don't think it's crazy to say that this Seahawks defense is a much better unit down the stretch for the rest of this season. But then we flip it over to the other side and we're talking about Geno Smith against the 49ers defense. And I mean, these guys have just been Geno Smith's white whale. I mean, he, he can never seem to figure these guys out. I mean, on paper, these two units are evenly matched. Seahawks offensively 10th in yards per play, 14th in success rate. 49ers defense are 7th and 17th. The problem for the Seahawks offense is they're relying on Geno Smith throwing the ball. They're relying on the passing attack and that plays directly into the strength of the 49ers defense. Against the pass, they're seventh in yards per pass attempt, 11th in success rate per drop back, 11th in EPA, second in overall DVOA. And on top of that, Geno Smith always seems to struggle against this team. In his career versus the 49ers, he's made four starts, uh, completing 67.3% of his passes, 231.8 yards per game, just 6.1 yards per pass attempt, two touchdowns, four interceptions, a 76.9 pass rating. That's ugly. He has not played well against the 49ers. And I mean, I don't know if I see that changing here. Geno Smith is a guy that wants to throw the ball downfield. In fact, that's the strength of his game. You can see from this chart here, I mean, his most effective passing depth is the deep pass. That's the strength of the 49ers defense. They do not let you go over the top on him. Maybe that's why he always seems to struggle against San Francisco. Uh, and this is a 49ers pass defense that just seems to be heating up. You can see in the first few games of the season, they were actually struggling 
against the pass against the Jets, Vikings, and Rams. 8.7 yards per attempt, 51.5% success rate per dropback, an average opponent pass rating of 103. But look at the numbers since then. Okay, against New England, but the Cardinals with Kyler Murray, Geno, Mahomes, Prescott, Mayfield. So this 49ers defense is seeing some great quarterbacks and still nobody can throw on them. So it doesn't give me a ton of hope here for Geno Smith against a defense that always seems to give him problems and a defense that's kind of getting red hot right now against the pass. Also, pass protection has been a bit of a problem for the Seahawks this year. 16th in pressure rate, 25th in pass blocking grade, 20th in adjusted sack rate. 49ers pass rush has been, I mean, not as good as we're used to seeing, but they still have a pass rush. 14th in pressure rate, 13th in pass rush grade, 13th in adjusted sack rate. Geno Smith has been terrible under pressure, and I mean truly terrible. He's got a 49.5 passer rating under pressure this year. That's 36th in the NFL. So he has not done a good job handling pressure. Seattle's offensive line has struggled in pass protection. Definitely not a great combination there. Although I will say great news for Seahawks fans. Abraham Lucas is finally back. He hasn't played at all this season. In fact, he only played, I think it was six games last year as well. He had a great rookie season back in 2022. Really hasn't been healthy since. He's finally back at right tackle. The Seahawks have been rocking with their third string right tackle for I want to say the last five or six games now, and he's been regularly getting abused. Now, Abraham Lucas has not played in a long time, so who knows how effective he's able to be in his first game back, but it has to be better than the production they were getting. They also got DK Metcalf back, which is huge. I think he only missed, I want to say two or three games. DK Metcalf uh, has missed, but he's back as well. So a couple pieces returning here for the Seahawks offense, and the 49ers defense is a little bit banged up. Still no Hufanga. He's been out for a while. Also, Charvarius Ward is going to miss another game. His daughter passed away. His one-year-old daughter, I think she was. It's terrible. Also, Nick Bosa is questionable. He participated in light practice on Friday, so I think he's going to play, but we'll see. Hargrave is still out as well, which will hurt in terms of defending the run, and we'll get to that in a second. So maybe if Bosa ends up not playing, Abraham Lucas is back. 49ers secondary isn't 100%. Maybe there is a path to Geno Smith finally having a good game against the 49ers. But personally, I'm not putting my money on that happening based on what we've seen so far. Now, what about Seattle's run game in this one? Because we know the 49ers defense is vulnerable to the run. We've seen it. In their last five games, they're allowing over 115 rushing yards per game, 4.54 yards per carry. 40.1% success rate per rush is actually okay. It's not that these numbers are terrible. I'm just saying you can run the ball on the 49ers. They're not an elite run defense, especially without Hargrave out there. So will the Seahawks be able to run the ball in this game? I mean, <laughs> how can we count on that happening? This Seahawks run game has been non-existent. In their last four games, they're averaging 74 rushing yards per game, 3.1 yards per carry. Success rate per rush is below 29%. So I, how can we count on the Seahawks running the ball in this one? Not to mention Kenneth Walker always seems to struggle against the 49ers. He can never run the ball against San Francisco. So although I do think the Seahawks defense can play a good game here on the road in San Francisco, it's just tough to have faith in Geno Smith and the Seahawks offense against a 49ers defense that they never seem to figure out. They can just never score points on this defense. So I'm not putting my money on it happening here, which is why it would only be San Francisco for me. But I'm not trying to lay six and a half points against the Seahawks defense, which I think is going to be improved, probably undervalued. Coming off a bye week in a division game, the 49ers haven't been covering the number. I just can't get a bet down, but I can't take the Seahawks either. So I guess 49ers minus six and a half or an under, but most likely this is going to be a pass for me. Next game. Last game of the night, we got Bengals on the road in LA to play the Chargers. Chargers laying one and a half points at home. Total sitting at 47 and a half, it looks like. Uh, I do see a couple 48s out there. So let's get into this matchup. We'll start with the Bengals offense against the Chargers defense. And this is looking like a pretty good matchup here. Bengals offensively 10th in yards per play, 11th in success rate. Look at the passing numbers, 12th in yards per pass attempt, second in success rate per drop back, fourth in EPA, seventh in DVOA against the Chargers defense that's looking top 10, maybe even top five, specifically top five against the pass. Fifth in yards per pass attempt allowed, first in success rate per drop back, second in EPA, fifth in DVOA. So definitely going to be quite the showdown here. Joe Burrow and the Bengals passing attack against the Chargers pass defense. That being said, I question the Chargers pass defense a bit. Look at the quarterbacks the Chargers have seen so far this year. Gardner Minshew, Bryce Young, Justin Fields, then you got Mahomes in there, Bo Nix, Kyler Murray, so Mahomes and Kyler Murray, you got two legitimate quarterbacks in there, Spencer Rattler, 
Jameis Winston, Will Levis. So forgive me if I'm questioning these elite pass defense numbers from the Chargers when seven of their nine games were against some really bad quarterback competition. We're talking bottom six, seven quarterbacks in the NFL. I'm not saying the Chargers pass defense isn't good, and they did look good in the Cardinals game. They lost that game, and that's another thing. The two quarterbacks they did see, Mahomes and Murray, that's two of their losses. They're six and three. They lost the only two games they saw legitimate quarterbacks. Now they're going to see Joe Burrow and the Cincinnati Bengals passing attack, certainly one of the best in the NFL. Now, the bad news for the Bengals offense is they're still banged up at offensive tackle. Trent Brown is still out. Orlando Brown Jr., not sure if he's going to be back. He returned to practice, I think, on Thursday and then missed Friday's practice. Not really sure what that means. They need him back badly. We've seen the pass protection take a dip since the Bengals had these injuries to the offensive tackle position. Uh, the good news, T. Higgins is back, which is obviously huge. We know how much of an impact he has to this offense. So T. Higgins back, still banged up at offensive tackle tackle which is a little worrisome because the Chargers pass rush may not be elite they're 21st in pressure rate but they're fifth in adjusted sack rate so this pass rush although it doesn't generate consistent pressure they record sacks now here's the good news for the Bengals offensive line I'm not sure if Khalil Mack plays in this game he's listed as questionable he's missed the entire week of practice he hasn't practiced all week I believe he has a groin injury that would be huge if he misses this game. I mean, Khalil Mack is their highest graded pass rusher this year. Joey Bosa's been on and off the field, not quite as effective as he used to be. So if Khalil Mack's out for this game, that would be a huge sigh of relief for Cincinnati. Um, so how does the Chargers secondary matchup against Joe Burrow? Oh, Asante Samuel Jr. is still out as well on the previous graphic. Um, but how does the Chargers secondary matchup against Joe Burrow? Second in zone frequency, second in too high safety frequency. A lot of zone coverage, a lot of too high safety looks. That is bad news for the Chargers defense because Joe Burrow is one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL against both. Against zone coverage this year, Joe Burrow, second in completion percentage, third in passer rating, fifth in yards per attempt. Against two high safety, second in passer rating, ninth in yards per attempt, 14 touchdowns and two interceptions against two high safety looks this year. So I know the Chargers defense has elite numbers against the pass, but they played a lot of bad quarterbacks, and I like this matchup for Joe Burrow, especially if Khalil Max out. I think Joe Burrow can throw the ball on this Chargers defense. I'm calling BS on these Chargers pass defense numbers. And as far as the run goes, I mean, in the last six games, the Chargers have been run on a bit. 5.42 yards per carry allowed actually isn't great. 121 rushing yards per game, but success rates down below 38%. So, I mean, this is a pretty solid run defense. The Bengals don't have, I mean, the Bengals run defense isn't terrible. Keep in mind, they've played the Chiefs. They've played a road game in Cleveland. They played the Ravens twice. I mean, these are some elite defenses that the Bengals have seen. They have an average to a slightly below average rushing attack. I don't know if they can run the ball on the Chargers, maybe a little bit. Uh, but as far as the matchup for Joe Burrow, I think you can throw the ball on this Chargers team, especially if Cleo Max out. But what about the matchup on the other side? Let's take a look at the matchup for the Chargers offense. Uh, as I'm sure you probably already know, Cincinnati's had their defensive struggles this year. 11th in yards per play allowed, but 29th in success rate. That being said, it's not like the Chargers offense is setting the world on fire here. 17th in yards per play, 29th in success rate. So the Bengals defense, 29th in success rate. Same goes for the Chargers offense, 29th in success rate. And remember how hard ball came out of the gate running the ball in those first couple games and everyone was like oh shit the Chargers are gonna have the rushing attack this year 6.1 yards per carry over 200 rushing yards per game in those first two games well they really haven't run the ball for shit since then in their last seven games they're averaging 3.6 yards per carry 30.2 percent success rate per rush is terrible under 97 rushing yards per game so the Chargers run game has just disappeared in the last seven games and I know we all think this Bengals defense is trash and I mean it's not a good defense at all that being said, in their last four games, they've actually done a solid job against the run. 100 rushing yards allowed per game, 3.8 yards per carry, 38.2% success rate per rush. Cincinnati's actually defending the run well right now. And look at the opponents. Yeah, the Raiders are in there. Cleveland's in there. So is Philadelphia and Baltimore, two of the most dynamic rushing attacks in the NFL. So Cincinnati might have themselves a decent little run defense uh, kind of under the radar. No one's really talking about it. They're playing some solid defense against the run. Here's the problem. Justin Herbert is playing well, and I mean really well. In the last four games, over 268 passing yards per game, 9.3 yards per attempt, over 53% success rate per drop back, 115 passer rating, starting to look like the Justin Herbert from 2019 or 2020. Old school Justin Herbert. He looks really good in the last four games. The Bengals haven't had much of a pass rush this entire season. They're 24th in pressure rate, 29th in adjusted sack rate. Justin Herbert should have plenty of clean pockets to throw from and look at his his numbers when given a clean pocket seventh in yards per pass of them fifth in pass rating eighth in turnover worthy play rate so he should have no problems 
making throws on this Cincinnati Bengals defense. And it actually gets worse for the Bengals defense. Trey Hendrickson might not play in this game. He hasn't practiced all week. I think BJ Hill's going to play, uh, but Trey Hendrickson missed the entire week of practice. If he's out, they really don't have a pass rush. And Justin Herbert should have a clean pocket basically every single time he drops back. I'm seeing points, points, points in this game, which is why I'm on the over in this one. And I actually bet it in three different ways. I took the over at 47 and a half. I took the Bengals team total over 23 and a half. And I took the Chargers team total over 23 and a half. I put a half unit on each, maybe just having a little bit of fun here. I do think it goes over and I do think both teams are able to score. So I took the over and I took both team total overs in this one. Uh, let's have some fun for Sunday night football. Unfortunately, I don't have time to get to any more games, but like I said before, live Live shows at 11 a.m. Eastern time. We'll go through every single game on the board. If you're able to make it, we'd love to see you in the comments. If you want to just go to the website and see what my top bets are and see all the bets that I personally have placed, uh, just head over to kylekerms.com and sign up for Sauce Network Plus. Just click on Open Bets. Let's have ourselves a great NFL Sunday. Please remember to bet responsibly. See you all in the morning.